Okay, go. All right, a couple of housekeeping things uh, here. Hopefully, like I said last month, we'll hopefully get the driveway put in so you, so you don't have to park on the road. It's kind of a dangerous road out here. I already told a few of you about it. There's a little hill right up here in front of the house. That's why I can't put a driveway here. They won't allow me to do it because of, of safety. And to be honest, I can understand that because people will run down this road like it's a racetrack. And if you're pulling out or coming in right here in front and somebody pops that hill, you have no time to react. Uh, just go to my driveway a couple of times, I've had that. So the other thing to keep in mind too, next time you come, come in the driveway, go to the second drive and come around. That first one is a blind spot too. And if somebody pops there, it's done. So please hit that second. I'll put a do not enter sign there. But that seems to be too establishment for me and I don't want to do that. So anyway, just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, Pine needles and things here for right now, you're not going to hurt that. That's where that driveway is going to be. I have some markers set up because I cut a tree down. Got this stuff as close to the ground as I can get, but some of the cars ride a little bit low and I don't want somebody breaking something on the bottom. Trucks are no problem, but there's plenty of room to drive the other side of it. I'll be taking that stump out. We don't worry about it when we get the driveway put in. So it's coming. And just the unfortunate part about it is that, uh, that uh, three letter word kind of gets in the way J O B. When I retire again, that won't be a problem. Hopefully that'll be very soon. So we'll have to work on that as well. Uh, we have some handouts in the back. We've got a couple new ones uh, uh, this, uh, this month. Um, I have one back there with some of the elected officials, name, numbers, contacts on them. So you might want to get a hold of that so you know who they are. It's not all of them, it's just a few of them. I will endeavor to get them all for you so you know who they are and who you need to contact if, if you need to get a hold of one for any, any reason or any purpose. Uh, the other thing I had back there was something I found. <coughs> it's called the budget explained in simple English. It kind of breaks it down so it's a little bit easier to understand. When you talk trillions, billions, all those zeros, it kind of gets lost because most of us don't deal with that kind of money, at least I don't. So what this does, it breaks it down into something that's a little more manageable and something that we, we see a little bit more in our day to day. So hopefully it'll help those uh, less informed to be more informed and have better understanding of what's happening to our uh, uh, country to through the uh, idiocies that we have in uh, in the office right now. So, and we'll work to change those as well. Uh, so, uh, I think that takes care of all the all those things. So, if you will, now that you're all settled, we'll stand. We'll have a pledge of allegiance and we're going to get started here this morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask your blessing from on this day. I ask your blessing from on this time. Father, I pray even now for the safety of those that are here as they travel home, that you'd watch over them and protect them. Father, I pray that everything that's said and done here would be to your honor and your glory and not for any particular person or group of people. Father, we just pray for your wisdom in each and everything that we do as we go throughout our day-to-day. Our, our -day. Father, we just pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. Now, for this to be assessed, knocking on our door, we're all about all right. The main topic today was Common Core. There is Common Core. Uh, we're going to be talking about that, go into a little bit of detail with that. There are reams and reams and reams of information, uh, things available uh, to you out there on the web. There's just so much of it, both sides. Uh, we're going to try and get you some, some things today to maybe help you understand some of those things, find your way through it, and if nothing else, give you an opportunity to, to question, to look see, and give you some places to go. I don't claim to be an expert, certainly not. Like most other things, it's changing, ever-changing. And so as long as there's that quest for knowledge, that's what we need to do, what we need to understand, that's what we should be doing. Before we do that, though, one of the things that, that has been under assault this administration is real good about doing one thing. Taking your attention to, to things over here while they're doing something down here. We can't take our eye off of that fact that that's what's probably happened. One of the things that they, that they like to attack is our Second Amendment rights. We keep hearing those things that surely that can't happen. Surely gun, gun confiscation won't happen here. I'd like to give you a recount of something that did happen. December 29, 1890. We're going back a long, long ways. It's the anniversary of the murder of 297 Sioux Indians at some place called Moonedy Creek on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. These 297 people were in their winter camp. They, they had 
they've gone there like they have for hundreds of years to uh, work out the winter. But they were murdered by federal agents and the 7th Cavalry, who had come there to do one thing and one thing only. That was to confiscate their firearms for this phrase, for their own safety and protection. We hear that a lot today. We have to put gun laws into place for our own safety and protection, and those of our kids and things. Well, listen to what happened. The slaughter began after the majority of the Sioux had peacefully turned in their firearms. They come and ask for them, the Sioux gave them to them. The cavalry, for some reason, began shooting and managed to wipe out the entire camp. Get this, 200 of the 297 people, there were women and children, massacred, killed, didn't matter. They were nothing. About 40 members of the 7th Cavalry were killed, but they were killed by their own guns exploding in their faces because they were inferior weapons. 20 members of the 7th Cavalry's death squad were named national heroes. They were awarded the Medal of Honor for their acts of heroism for taking those arms. By the way, the army that we have today, the military that we have today, the leadership, one of the questions they're asked as they move up through the ranks is if you were given the order to fire on American citizens, would you? What a terrible thing to ask any soldier. If they answer in the affirmative, they're likely to get the promotion. If they answer in the negative, it doesn't happen. Now we hear very little about wounded knee today, any place, anywhere, anytime. It's usually not mentioned in our history books, in our classes, or any place else. And a lot of the accounts that we see on TV depict things that aren't necessarily historically correct. Wounded Knee, keep this in mind, Wounded Knee was among the, the first federally backed gun confiscation attempts in the United States. Now, before we get on that emotional bandwagon that everybody gets on when you hear things like the massacre of all those little children uh, on the East Coast, we need to take a moment to reflect on the real purpose of the Second Amendment, what it was for, what, it was, what did our founders put it in there to do? And one of the things that they talk about uh, there is the, the uh, Second Amendment is for uh, hunting and target shooting. Well, if you think back at the time that it was put into place, hunting was an everyday occurrence. They had to do that to put food on the table. They, it wasn't a luxury. It wasn't something that they did annually once a year. It was an everyday occurrence. And by the way, both men and women participated in that feat to try and get food on the table. The other thing they talk about is target practice. Well, in those days, they used a particular weapon called a muzzle loader. And use a muzzle loader, they had ball. Uh, not a projectile, but a ball. They were very expensive. So they didn't waste them doing target practice. So to think that the Second Amendment was put in there for hunting and target uh, sporting is just an asinine thing to, to believe. It just didn't occur that way. It didn't happen that way. Our founders did not intend that to happen. Matter of fact, it was written by people who fled, if you remember, oppression and the tyranny of Europe. And it was put in there to protect them from a tyrannical government. Okay, not target shooting, not hunting, but to protect each and every individual. Now, as time goes forward, all of us in, the, in this country continue to lose little chunks of our personal freedoms and liberties. One way or another, little bits and pieces are taken away from us. The Patriot Act that was signed into effect by G.W. Bush is one of those things. And by the way, it's continued by Barack Obama. He campaigned against it when he ran, but he still has it, and he's enhanced it. It's, it's a whole lot worse than it was under Bush. But that particular legislation took some of our freedoms away. Every day, a little bit more is taken away. Kind of like that frog that sits in a pan of water on the stove. You know, it feels pretty good at first. And the temperature gets turned up, and the next thing you know, it's too late to get out. And we gotta be careful of that. We don't want that water turned up any hotter than it is now. Uh, before any American citizen accepts whatever new arms legislation that comes down the pike from our government, um, we, need to, we need to think about it. We need to consider what happened at Wounded Knee so that it doesn't happen again. Don't buy into the information that it's for your own safety. It's for your own protection. The Second Amendment protects you. Okay, now, that's not to say everybody has one. And I certainly understand <coughs> you have your own personal convictions about it but it's still an important part of our life. It's an important part of our heritage. Our founding fathers were very intelligent men, very intelligent men. It's hard to believe even today that, that uh, what they put into effect is still there, still very viable today if we just use it. And that's another subject we're not gonna get into today. Without the Second Amendment, we'll be totally stripped of any ability to defend ourselves when the time comes. 
I pray that it doesn't. But in this day and age, you, you never know. You never know. Okay, that's that's no extra charge for that one today. <coughs> common Core. Let's talk Common Core. Common Core philosophy goes something like this: Students should be trained as workers, not educated as human beings and citizen leaders. Bit of a surprise when I found that it's. I had to sit there and look at that and think about it for a moment. Not citizen leaders, but as workers. What does that sound like? Not something that I want for my grandkids. Now, here's the evidence of that philosophy. By the 12th grade, the study of creative literature, and we'll talk about that as we get into this a little bit more, will be reduced by as much as 70% in favor of something called informational text. Literature informational text, and we'll get definitions of those here shortly. But keep that in mind. Remember what that is. Now, when I uh, say, well, I see a lot of a lot of people of my age or so. So I was going to say, when your children, but my children have already come and gone, so they're past that. But our grandchildren go to school here in America. Most likely, their education is going to come from this criteria, uh, not by state education associations which is what we've been accustomed to in the past. It's going to change. Even, even the National Education Association won't have any part of it. And I'm not, a, I'm not a proponent of the NEA, but they won't have any part of this either. Rather, it's going to be developed by ready? United Nations. As they trail this back to where Common Core really began, it begins in the United Nations. Scary thought. They're such a good organization to begin with, right? They do so much good for everybody, just what we need. But their education arm is called United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Sounds pretty impressive. But you might have heard it by its acronym. UNESCO is the acronym. That's probably a little bit more common than that long, long, uh, long name. Again, it's the educational organization that sets this up. And by the way, this, and it'll be called Common Core, it is called Common Core, Friends of Sovereign in the United States, and we'll talk about that too, how that's, how that's happening. Um, one of the problems with Common Core is that it's set to indoctrinate uh, unsuspecting children. You know, kids are, are, as you know, are sponges. They absorb things quickly. They learn things very quickly, particularly at a young age. And so the earlier they get to them, the more likely that is to happen. Um, their agenda is to teach every child in the world <coughs> A universal education curriculum, and that education curriculum is called Common Core Standards. It, it uh, by their definition, it provides a c consistent, clear understanding of what students are expected to learn, so teachers and parents know what they need to do to help them. The standards are designed to be robust and relevant to the real world, reflecting the knowledge and skills that our young people need for success in college. Talk about that in a minute too, and careers. With American students fully prepared for the future, our communities will be best positioned to complete, compete successfully in the global economy. Sounds great. Sounds good. To get into the media, you see what they're using as education, what they're calling education. Now, there are a great number of people in the education community that view these global standards as an answer to educational woes. It does take a lot of pressure off of them and we'll talk about that here shortly too, but there are others of us that once you get into it, once you see it, once you understand it, you say, wait a second, we need, let's back up. Let's rethink this, let's take a look at that. Because once they're successfully implemented, it'll provide unfettered access of our educational system by the United Nations. That's one of the biggest things I can think of. I don't want the United Nations here, period. I think we should be out of it completely, much less giving them access to our children through Common Course. Some textbooks and curricula for our public schools have already been written by UNESCO, and they're already in use. Um, if I remember right, didn't Cherish have one of those down there in Houston we were looking at it when we were down there? Anyway, they're, they're here in the United States, they're already, and they're distributed, just so you know, by the International Baccalaureate Program. So that's something else you need to remember. International Baccalaureate, because they are a distributor of lots of, lots of books throughout the country. Um, and once they, once they write the curriculum, they must have authority to develop all testing tools. So once they've written the materials, it's up to them to develop how it's going to be tested, how they're going to prove themselves, how it's, how it's effective. 
Now, this back of our curriculum upsets parents and teachers because the focus includes some other things. Something called sustainable development. I'm not really sure exactly what that means, but that's what it's for, one of the things. Abortion rights, gay marriage, universal disarmament, and social justice. We've all heard of those things, and we all know what that means to our country. I don't know about you, but I don't want my kindergartner learning these things. They don't need it. My high school, or I think for that matter, that's my job as a parent. The problem with the Common Core Standard is not that they promote reading, writing, and arithmetic, because they do have those things in there. But it's that dangerous thing called ideology that they brainwash, indoctrinate our children away. The things we were just talking about. And as I said, their agenda includes teaching social justice, abortion rights, population control, environmentalism, gay marriage. We need to be very careful with those things. The easiest way to implant their ideologies into these unsuspecting minds of our youngest is to get them early. Now, while their program right now is directed at K-12, they have another mandate that UNESCO is, is doing. It's called Early Childhood Care and Education. Once again, sounds great, doesn't it? Acronym is ECCE. So if you see that, that's what that is. Early Childhood Care and Education. Because we all want our little ones taken care of. That's, that's near and dear to all of our hearts. We're certainly looking for them to be to be taken care of. These programs are a little bit different because they tend to health, nutrition, security, and learning. Again, all the things that we care about, all the things that we're interested in with our children. They also provide something I didn't get it booked up before I came down here, but I'll just throw it out there. So don't hold me to this one. Well, you can because it's part of the program. I'm just not sure what it means. They're going to provide for children's holistic development. Okay. Anybody have any idea what that is? Me either, but they're going to provide for it. We'll have to see what that is. Um, the first, it, it organized the first world conference of these, uh, this curriculum back in September of 2010. Um, it culminated in the adoption of a global action called this, and this really tells a story. Moscow Framework for Action and Cooperation, Harnessing the Wealth of Nations. You can't do something simple like education program. No, you got to get this thing so you can understand what it means. Moscow framework for action and cooperation, harnessing the wealth of nations. So let's spread the wealth around. Right? This is an educational program. Why are we looking at harnessing the wealth of nations in an education program? The United Nations believes that we should have a uniform global educational system. And children, even from birth, should have the right to an early education. Something we need to be careful of and aware of. Now, grassroots conservatives have been mobilizing for a while uh, to understand what Common Core is, to see where it is, what it's doing, and what can be done about it. When Race to the Top was introduced as part of the 2009 stimulus package from this administration, states were bribed with billions, that's with a B, of dollars by the Obama administration. It was coordinated at the time by Arnie Duncan, who was the, the, he was the Secretary of Education. Contingent fund qualifications for the money was the state's adoption of Common Core standards. Again, Common Core is a top-down, one-size-fits-all curriculum. And because of that, it gives the government entrance into localized education. So you're going to be dictated from Washington, but they're going to know exactly what we're doing right here in Eastwood, Indiana. We'll talk about some state things in a moment. As more light starts to come about this and the negative effects of these new standards, parents and teachers alike are becoming more and more concerned about the lack of say and influence that they'll have in the classroom and in the curriculum. And this brings us to the real crux of Common Core. It undermines the very essence of choice can't go to your school board, you can't go to your teacher, you can't go to your principal about things because it's dictated to them by somebody else, somewhere else, all of it is. Maybe that's why they love it. They don't have so much to prepare for. They don't have so much responsibility anymore. And when you come and complain about it, you say, it's not my job. I'm being told to do this by Washington. This is the curriculum that we have. The founders of CCS assume that every classroom and school district function in precisely the same way, which is part of the problem. K-12 
Can you imagine teaching a, a student in a major city, New York, Washington, Chicago, the exact same way we teach right here in Greensburg, Indiana? Same curriculum, the same stuff. Does it make sense? Do they have the same needs? Do they have the same anything? That's part of the problem. But they, and they also assume that they'll learn at the same level, by the way, at the same time. Um, parents and teachers have been entrusted to work hand in hand to decide what's best for their students, right from the beginning. With this curriculum, that's all taken away. That doesn't happen. You can't do it. By the way, just as a, another thought, do we want to trust our kids with learning math and other things the same way that they've worked out in the $17 billion budget? Right. I'm not so sure their math, I want that math taught to my kids. I'd rather teach it myself instead of that, that thought process. And here's another thing. Common Core standards have never been taste, tested anywhere. Anywhere. And as many politicians are discovering the country's not ready to follow Obamacare, are we going to be ready to do the same thing with our education? I think it's a little scary when you try and implement a program as, as thorough and as complete as this is and entrust our next our heritage, the next generation, to something that's never been tested, never been tried, never been proven. Why would we do that? Does that make sense? Beyond the lack of choice within the realm of the curriculum, Common Core leaves the parents with particularly troubling non-decision. Or would you not make any decisions? It's in the school. The book says this, that's what it is. You didn't even have to think. As it stands, the government, the government, there's another thing too, will begin to data mine children from kindergarten until the time they enter the workforce. You understand what data mine is? Data mining is getting into whatever that child is, each and every aspect of life, drill down. Find out everything there is about it. Here's some of the things that they're going to use to start that with. Um, it'll be based on the student's religion, their moral attitudes, and political affiliations. Mm. Once that information is gathered, by the way, it will be sold to a private company called In Bloom. In Bloom is funded by special interests. One of those special interests, by the way, is the Bill Gates Foundation. Once they do whatever it is they're going to be doing to it, they'll give it back to the government so the government can use it however they see fit. No less than nine states, including New York, prohibits parents from opting out of this data collection. So if you're in the Common Core program, you can't say, I don't want, I don't want to answer the questionnaire. I don't want to give you the information. It's not allowed. Now, I'm not sure what the penalty is if you refuse. You get a lot of trouble, I guess, or a lot of, a lot of hassle with it, but it's, it's not allowed. You can't opt out. Again, keep in mind, Common Core only dimension diminishes choice and freedoms for families. You don't have it. You're completely gone. It reduces the ability of the teachers to create and innovate to meet the needs of their students. They have a lesson plan in this, in this schedule, in this book, and that's what, they, that's what they do. So they can't be creative. I, I don't know about you, but I had teachers in my life that I remember because of their creative way that they taught things. How they inspired, not just me, but maybe some other students in the class. And that's why we have people that were outstanding, valedictorians or, or great people or whatever, president of the class. We had all those things because we had teachers, we had mentors who taught us things based on our skills, on our level of understanding and how well we could, could do it. That's all taken away. That's all gone here. Because this assumes every student is exactly the same. The problem you have is that it doesn't take into account those high achievers, and you know what I'm talking about. You get, you know kids, you, you may have been one, who can just grasp things in a second. And you have the ones on the bottom who just say, you know what, I can't understand this. Those people are gonna be lost. You gotta dumb down these up here, bring them into this group, and the ones on the bottom, it's like, well, we're gonna go sit in the quarter giant. Go play with the truck. Go play with your dog. We don't have time, we're moving on. It's a danger that we have. The curriculum may be good, but it's that sameness that we got to watch out for because we, contrary to what we've been told, we are unique. We are exceptional, each and every one of us in our own right. And that's the way that God designed us. That's the way we are. We're American people and we are unique. We are different. That's what makes us who and what we are. There's also another 
another part of this too, it's a negative impact on education and some uh, biblical literacy. Here's a guy, his name is David Coleman. David Coleman is a non-English teacher who wrote the Common Core National English Language Arts curriculum. Now how do you take a non-English person and have him write the curriculum for English? I understand, but he did. Um, he's also on the uh, offensive trying to persuade Christians, and why could Christians, I'm not sure, but he's trying to persuade Christians to embrace this new national standard. According to Coleman, students educated under Common Core would be better readers and better able to understand scripture as a result. They'll enjoy deeper and more satisfying spiritual lives. Quite a claim for us at school standards. Uh, the <laughs> it's crazy. We've taken God out. We can't pray. We can't have a Bible in school. But they're using that as one of the selling points for core standards. Such an organizing thing of this ELA, the English Language Arts, is that study of creative literature must be diminished in favor of something called informational text. Maybe that's why he can do it, because he's not a literary. The idea is that students will be drilled in the types of documents they are likely to encounter in their entry-level jobs. Not college, not leadership, entry-level jobs. So this curriculum is set up so that we don't have citizen leaders anymore. We just have a group of workers. Now, what is Coleman's evidence that switching focus from classic literature to this non-fiction informational text stuff will free better readers? None. He has none. Actually, it's quite the opposite. All historical evidence confirms the opposite. A person named Dr. Sandra Statosky, and we'll talk about her in just a moment too, and another Dr. Mark, I'm going to butcher his name, Broman, have shown this. And this is a quote. Classic literary texts pose strong challenges in vocabulary, structure, style, ambiguity, point of view, figurative language, and irony. Now, all that means is that if you read the classics, you understand a whole lot more than you do if you just read informational texts, okay? That's Reader's Digest, or Don's version of what they say. Okay. Um, the premise that great literature creates great readers is validated in something called the Massachusetts Experience. State of Massachusetts rejected this workforce training model back in 1993. Again, Common Core is not new. It's been around for a while. They've been trying to push it for a number of years. It may not have been called that back then, but that's what it was. Instead, they embraced a reading curriculum rich in high-quality literature. The curriculum incorporated even into their vocational high schools. Remember those, by the way? Vocational high schools where you had shop class? You actually go down and well, build a birdhouse, you know, an ashtray, whatever it was, you can actually do those things. And you taught people to do that. Anyway, uh, they had uh, high schools for that. Um, but even those students were required to explore the classics. So the ones that were headed for college and the college curriculum classes and the ones that were in vocational curriculum classes, all were required to read the same books, the same literature, study the same things. You know what the result was? This is amazing. Massachusetts SAT scores rose for 13 consecutive years, beginning in 1993. Massachusetts students routinely scored highest in the nation on national reading tests. Didn't matter if they were college bound or not, they still had the highest scores. However, that was before Massachusetts got rid of that and joined Common Core. Since that time, their scores have begun to drop. But he also advocates something called that he calls closed reading. It's unencumbered by anything that might help the reader actually understand the text. Here's an example. He trained English teachers to present the Gettysburg Address cold. By that he means there was no instruction about the historical situation, no definition of purpose of the address, or any of the scriptural allusions that are in it, by the way. <coughs> No dramatic reading of the speech, so nobody could read it. 
Students are to consider it as merely a collection of sentences that kind of fell on the page in the keynote speech. Fundamental problem with Common Core approach is that to achieve this job training goals, it recognizes no difference between complex text and another complex text. Great work of literature has value beyond the complexity of the words that it uses. It allows students to understand the human condition by reading those things. It gives them some imagination. It gives them an opportunity to go places they may not ever physically go. But if they read those things, they can go there. They can be there. They can experience those things versus the informational way of doing the informational text, which doesn't give them any 3D imagination at all. This was down and said, here we by. The fundamental problem with Common Core is that to achieve this, you've got to treat everybody exactly the same. Everybody is treated exactly the same. Here's another example of, of their learning techniques. This is a math. I heard this, I heard this. So it's not something I read. I actually heard this and saw this on TV. Instructor was teaching a group of teachers how to instruct in math. She gave this example. She said, if you give the student a math example, five times four, and they come up with the wrong answer, is it really a wrong answer? Five times four is 20, right? She goes, well, it may be 20, but if they give you an answer of 11, the answer's not wrong if they use the right thought process to get there. <laughs> Why math? It just, these, I don't know where these people come up with these things. I don't know how, how they do it. But anyway, I heard her say that. She said, now, you have to correct them, make sure they understand that 5 times 4 is 20. But if they're thinking correctly, they just got the wrong numbers, that's okay. <coughs> well, I'm sorry. You want that person giving you change at McDonald's? No. <laughs> or anywhere else. I don't think so. I don't think so. <clears throat> now, before we get into the state, uh, some of the state things, she'll bring you back back home to us. Uh, here's a list of some of, uh, cons for the Common Core curriculum that was given uh, by a lady from uh, Pickens, South Carolina. It makes some good sense. Our children are unique. Our state is unique. Common Core is one size fits all. Unelected bureaucrats created the standards with money from special interest and five experts refused to sign off on its validity. That was there in South Carolina. <clears throat> this happened here, by the way. There was no legislative vote. State boards of education approved Common Core. It's expensive to implement. Private data collection on your child will include the things we've talked about. Oh, one of the things I didn't mention is medical history and a psychological profile. <clears throat> you imagine your five-year-old? Little effort is being given to accommodate gifted learners and struggling learners that we talked about a moment ago. They're all the same. It would likely cause teachers to teach to the test. They have no reason to teach better or be a better teacher. Classic literature study will be lessened and students will read informational texts and language arts. Parents, teachers, and local schools will have less control over education. And then the last one is, you have the power to stop common core. Don, can, sustainable development that you talked about, that's keywords for Agenda 21. And so that will be put into this program too. All you need to do is go look at Agenda 21. The other thing I'd like to comment on that you presented, what happens when you take imagination away from children? You develop people that are voting in our system right now that don't know, don't have the knowledge, don't know what they're voting for, and what is a counter example of that? Dr. Benjamin Carson. And if you think about he, Dr. Benjamin Carson and the prayer speech that he gave, and if you haven't heard that, I encourage you all to look that up on the internet and listen to that video. He talks about how his mother forced him to read books when he was younger. And he said, I was born to poverty. I was born to only having a mother, no father in my presence. And he said, through those books, I saw that poverty wasn't a permanent situation, that it was something I could get out of. It, it gives people hope. 
That's a real good point, too, because Benjamin Carson would have been one of those that had been left behind. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know, he went on to be the head of neurology at John Hopkins University. For kids. Yeah. His mother forced him to read even though she couldn't read. Yes. That's correct. Right or not. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. So there's many, many dangers. It's far, far reaching. So let's talk about Indiana for a moment. Common Core here in Indiana. State lawmakers spent several hours back in August listening to expert and public testimony concerning Indiana's use of Common Core for their, as their educational standards. Um, Common Core was Common Core uh, uh, was legislated or become the state standard back in 2010 here in Indiana. How are some of the participants? Who, who met in these first few meetings started to question and asked that it be stopped. They looked at the agenda that we were just talking about here that was going to be put placed upon Indiana schools by the Obama administration. And we all know it goes a little bit deeper than that. In fact, Mitch Daniels, whom I agree with on lots of different things, do not misunderstand me. I think Mitch Daniels is a great governor for us. There are lots of things that we agree on, lots of things we don't. Okay, it could have been a whole lot worse. But Mitch Daniels appointed State Board of Education members who adopted Common Core for Indiana schools. He appointed the people that put it in place. Republican Tony Bennett, who was a superintendent at that time, emphatically endorsed Common Core and recommended its adoption. But, big but here, spurred by people of interest, the argument was on the same Tea Party, and other uh, factors, conspiracy theories and things, Republican-controlled General Assembly this year paused that implementing, I mean, because the term that they used, they, they, they postponed it, they stopped it, they pulled back. It made Indiana the first state to do this, and it ordered the State Board of Education to reconsider where the common core should be Indiana's educational standard. That decision, by the way, is supported by our current governor, Mike Pence. But it has left a lot of teachers and parents wondering, okay, what are our kids going to be taught? What's going to happen this, as school began this year? So let's take a look at some of those things. Now, I'll give you something that was, that was given to these folks, these legislators, by Dr. Sanders Tatosky, S-T-O-T-S-K-Y. She's a professor of educational reform at the University of Arkansas. I won't give you all this because there's quite a bit here. Her education, her background is pretty impressive. She knows what she's talking about, I guess what I'm trying to say. Lots and lots of experience in different things here. She says this, she says, I will speak to the following points. Number one, the mediocre quality of Common Core's English language reading standard, especially in grades six through 12, and what it lacks of international benchmarking. Number two, the high quality of Indiana's 2006 2008 English language reading standards. And number three, we won't get into that one so much, the non-transparent process that we use to develop Common Core standards. We all understand people talk transparency and then don't. All right? And that's pretty much what that is, so we won't need to get too much into that one. But here's what she says about point one. College readiness standards for English language arts and reading do not, do not aim to level for a level of achievement that signifies readiness for college level work. They're not teaching these kids how to read to what wants. They point to more than readiness. They, it gives a little more than high school diploma equivalency. Because we don't yet know the level of reading of the passages we use for tests. In other words, since there's no test, there's no standards, they don't know what it's supposed to be. All, they, all she knows at this point is that the core curriculum gives them a, a level of reading that gets them out of high school. That's all. Nothing more. To judge by the reading levels of high school examples of complexity in Common Core, the average reading level of those passages now being developed are about grade level seven. Mm -hmm. So it's middle school. That they graduate? Mm -hmm. grade level That's seven. all you're required to reach in the Common Core standards. They will graduate with seventh grade level. Reading. Common Core's college readiness standards were deliberately designed as empty skill sets to enable a large number of high school students to be declared college ready. 
That's all it was. It was just an opportunity for them to say, we taught these kids so they're ready for this. <coughs> Nothing more. Doesn't mean they're college ready. Just means that they meet the standard that, well, they don't even know what the standard is yet because they haven't developed it. Second point, and, I, and this is probably the most important point to me. She said, I draw on the Fordham Institute's 2010 review of Indiana's 2006 academic standards and 2008 core standards for English language. Fordham's overall rating is as follows. Clarity and specificity. Oh, I like that word. Specificity. <laughs> Annie uses it all the time. Specificity. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Makes you sound intelligent whether you are or not. Specificity. <laughs> anyway, the score is three out of three. Content and rigor, seven out of seven to give them a score of ten out of ten. Perfect score. Indiana's. This is a score that can't be topped, and these are her words. Indiana's own ELA standards were far superior to common course. It is not clear why Indiana's Board of Education chose to trade in a silk purse for a sow's ear. <laughs> that is, to give its secondary education teachers an inferior set of standards to aim for. Okay. So we were, we were up here, why would we bring it down? It just doesn't make any sense. Bottom line, and these are her words, Indiana's standards are clearer, more thorough, easier to read than the Common Core standards. No reason to change. No reason to move out. Stay the course. And again, this is from a doctor who's proposed it. Now, continuing on with that, uh, according to EAG News, Indiana Governor Mike Pence stated that they will no longer participate in something called the Partnership of Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers, or the PARCC. I didn't even know we were part of that. But the state of Indiana was. It officially withdraw effective August 12th, so we're out of that program. It is the right, re it is the right and responsibility of the state to make independent, fiscally responsible decisions regarding standards and assessments for the good of all the people of Indiana. That's my pants. Now he can only do that if the state superintendent agrees. The State Department of Education spokesperson has said that Superintendent Glenda Ritz agrees with Pence's decision. So with that decision, we pulled out of this PRCC. Who are, who are pushing for their core curriculum? She's a Democrat, by the way. Yep. Um, as I said earlier, they were adopted in 2010 under the guidance of uh, former Superintendent Tony Bennett. Kindergarten and first grade teachers are already teaching Common Core standards in Indiana. Second grade teachers were slated to switch to Common Core in the 2013-14 year, which is this year. However, the Indiana Department of Education, with all these other things happening, has asked second graders to continue with the old standards. In other words, don't implement the new stuff. Stay where you were, which I think is good news. Their, their eyes are being opened. In just case you don't know or aren't aware of it, Pence's wife is a school teacher. So he's very familiar with all those other aspects that come into it that you hear from teachers and administrators about things. He's familiar. Um, the Kinder County uh, Community School Board met uh, September 12th. Social Superintendent Dr. Mike, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, Langiv Langivan. If you see him, you know him. Apologize to him if I butchered his name. I, I don't need to. He told the board during their discussion that he feels Common Core will be implemented in the state in the next two years. Uh, based on things that I'm seeing here and reading here, I don't see that happening. But we have uh, administrators here in our county that apparently are pushing for this, this core curriculum. You need to be very careful then. Mike Pence also did something else. He went on a, uh, a panel that was moderated by ABC News Andrew Mitchell with Kentucky Governor Steve Basher and Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick. He said this, I'm someone who believes that education is a state and local function. Uh, he went on to say that he had opposed George Bush's, George W. Bush's No Child Left Behind. Our goal is simple. Our standards should be written for Hoosiers and by Hoosiers with a very high standard. That's our lone star. Education should be governed as close to the people who rely on it as possible. I want Hoosiers to be in the driver's seat. 
He also added this, we're just taking a look at Common Core. Yeah. So it doesn't sound to me like there's a plan to implement it, we're just taking a look. And I think that's a prudent thing to do. You need to look at it and make sure before you jump to it like they've done. He also explained we should be skeptical of one size fit all solution. The backdrop to that is to make sure we are part of an innovative movement that our kids want. In closing, he said this, it's all about the teachers and people in Indiana. I'm someone who believes teaching is a calling. We have to make sure we are funding excellence. We have to make sure resources are reaching the men and women who are standing in the classroom every day. This is about the kids. This is about expanding opportunity. We can't succeed in the classroom. We aren't going to succeed in the marketplace. Now, having said that, let me, let me leave you with some thoughts here about this, this mess. Common Core standards have never been tested in the classroom. Contrary to what they say, and I have I, I have some, a list that says that they have been. I can't find it any place. And every expert that I see, every expert that I've read said they've not been tested in the classroom. It's experimental without <coughs> any proof that will boost student achievement. Our children are getting things. They don't need to be experiments. They're our heritage. They're what we're going to leave this country to. We don't need to experiment with them. Besides that, we have something that works. Let's just use it. Under Common Core, college readiness means preparation for a non-selective two-year college. A what? Oh, no. Non-selective <coughs> two-year college. Community, school. Was Community college. college. Not, not a university. Indiana's previous standards were judged superior to Common Core. <coughs> By the way, that's even using Common Core standards. They're still superior. Why? Why would we want to change? Anyway, Common Core math students will put that standards will put Indiana students two years behind their counterparts in high-performing countries. One of the things that we're trying to get away from, one of the things we're trying to improve, is upping their education. This won't do it. Common Core requires teaching geometry with an experimental method, never used successfully anywhere in the world. Under Common Core, students will graduate from high school reading at a seventh grade level. So those are some basic things for Common Core. Hopefully you got your interest. Well, they want America going. to be the workforce of the world. Well, we're not leaders. We're not, we're not, Common Core is not designed to make exceptional people. It's not designed to find those leaders. It's not designed to help them become leaders, any of our kids. Something that we were always taught when we were in school. Yes, Gene. Um, if I understood you right, you said Indiana's um, current system is better than the Common Core system, and yet there are parts of it that have been implemented, correct? That's correct. I'll tell you what, everybody here I think knows that most of them can't even count your change back, but if you want a real education, go take some college courses like I did last summer and watch these kids struggle, drop out of class, I took a writing class, and we had to proofread three of the other people's writings for that class. You couldn't, they couldn't read, they couldn't write. It was awful. I mean, I was aghast. They don't even have, in a lot of cases, these kids trying to take these college classes, the basic knowledge of a regiment in order to get their homework done. It, it was a real learning experience for me. And, and you know, when you hear uh, some of them like Rush Limbaugh talk about the low information voters, it's not hard to understand when you see this. She's exactly right. We need to be aware of it. We need to do everything that we can to become aware. Low information voters, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be there. I want to learn, I want to know as much as I can about whatever it is so I can make an intelligent decision. I don't expect people to believe me. I don't expect people to, to agree with everything that I say, but at least listen, at least try, at least question what it is. Question anything that I've said, by the way. Go find out. Make sure. 
that what I told you is correct. I do my best to make sure that I give you all the information I can as accurately as I possibly can. Norma can tell you she spends evenings alone sometimes uh, with, me, with me doing my research because I think it's important. I think it's valuable. Just as each and every one of us. By the way, I was just going to say, I understand what you said about uh, Governor Pence looking at it. Well, just so long as we, the people, are really watching how they're looking at it, and that's as far as it goes. I mean, we have to really stay on top. That's why it's important. By the way, one of the handouts had some elected official information on it. That's why it's important that you have information on all the elected officials Both so you can do up. just that. You can talk to them. You can express your opinion. They need to know. If they don't hear from you, they assume everything's okay. Everything's fine. And they're going to go continue right down that path. Let them know. Let them prove to you their point of view, whatever that may be. And sometimes they just accept it blindly, too. And Don, isn't there federal monies, as I understand well, lots it, of federal monies. that are tied to this? So Absolutely. that temptation is always there. Yeah. That's one of the reasons a lot of schools bought into it because it's the way to get some funds. Billions of yes. dollars. Billions. Donnie. Yeah. My grandson goes to Milroy School, the elementary school, which of course is part of Rush County. And when he was in kindergarten going into the first grade, I was told that they were doing away with handwriting or cursive, use the PC word here, um, mm -hmm. because they, they were focusing on keyboarding skills. Right. They, couldn't, they didn't care if these kids could you know, print or write as long as they could keyboard. And then there was talk, and I don't know if it's happened, but there was talk of doing away with spelling because of spell check. Now, if the child can't spell it to begin with, how would he know if there's more than one spelling, like in the word rain? How would he know which one is correct? I mean, yep, that's right. there's lots of it there. So I don't know if that's part of what Common Core is about or not, but I was appalled. Yeah, well, it's already on TV. I don't know if you've seen a Baldwin commercial on credit card or something, he's a substitute teacher. And he asked the kid, the students, he asked the students what she was teaching. And they said spelling, he said, wait a minute, that's not a real class, that's an app, right? We don't need to worry about that. Okay, so it's every place, it's everywhere. We, we just need to be aware of it. Hopefully, I've done that today, give you some things that, that you didn't know, or weren't aware of. Hopefully it helps helps you understand, pass them along. Pass them on. Yep. They don't teach cursing. 